A session number 516, Reverend Timothy to Real 2. So it all depended on you to improve yourself in the language. So I went to these uh, extra classes. Also, the government had a sort of a incentive scheme and they gave out badges. Then now they got uh, your primary standard and then they got your middle standard and then got your upper standard, they got a special standard. They have four badges. And uh, when you pass this test, you get your badges. But I don't think we got any bonus for that. <laughs> they, were, they were short of money. And very soon we found that our salary wouldn't, wouldn't last a, a week. It was a very hard time. Did you go for the lessons at Shonan, uh, at the Hongganji school on your own? Or? Yeah, yeah, all on our own. Did, uh, did the Japanese did the um, Japanese judges or send you to the school? No, when we were in the Judicial Officers Institute, the teacher would come uh, something like twice a week. So we we have the privilege. We had special classes. But apart from that, by that time I didn't go to the Honganji because we were so involved in legal studies. And in fact, they treated us so well, they took over a boarding house, a small hotel in Waterloo Street. Then they converted it to be our boarding house, dormitory, and they employed a special cook and got special rations, where we were fed by the government, you know, on, on government uh, expense. Uh, during the time when you were attending uh, the Honganji school, uh, was it compulsory that uh, interpreters had to attend Japanese language courses? No, it's up to you. But everybody wanted to learn Japanese then. They, we were all sort of competing with one another to learn the language. How were the working conditions like under the Japanese? Besides the you have the times you had, uh, had these uh, brown outs, you know. Black outs and brown outs were a common practice, and uh, up to a certain period, we, the lights were on. I mean, we were free. But then when the war began to come back, you know, we had certain periods of brown outs and so forth. We went to uh, work, everyone on a bicycle, because all the cars were taken by them. And whoever had cars, of course, were those privileged ones. You might have car, but you have no petrol. So I had my cars rendered after running a while and there no petrol, so that's it. <laughs> so we gave it up. We went to work on bicycle. And usually, you give a lift to your colleague. You know? My friend who was working in the, uh, in the legal department, courts, one of the interpreters from Ipo stayed with us. So when we went to work, I would uh, carry him on the back of my bicycle. And vice versa, sometimes he'll carry me. Mm -hmm. The working conditions were the same? Yeah, the working hours the same. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything bad to us. They were quite, in fact, uh, obliged to us. They felt very happy that we could, uh, could go back and work. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the pay was quite low. So did they supplement with Rations or other fringe benefits? After some time, they give you some coupons, you know, uh, for cigarettes and for, for, for this or that, but that was uh, very meagre. Yeah? The research department that you mentioned under uh, Lieutenant, Lef Lieutenant, Lieutenant Mukai. Mukai. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of research was economic. he doing? It's all economic research. Economic and cultural. In other words, he keeps on uh, making these researches, then he had these sacro style stapled into booklets, and these were distributed to all the, I believe, the senior administrators, that they would know the regions in which they are in and what are the conditions. It's purely uh, economic and cultural research. This research department comes under the courts? No. They only borrow a court building. 
It was housed in the one of the rooms because the Supreme Court was very spacious and very luxurious building at the time, just newly completed. Everybody likes to go there. Do you know um, this research department, uh, fish, under fish, Japanese department? Or? Anyway, it's an economic research. It's all under the Japanese military administration. Mm -hmm. So under which section, I cannot tell you. Besides Lieutenant Mukai, were there any other Japanese officers in this? department? Interestingly, he was the only one. Prolific writer. He keeps on writing day and night. He would study the English report and he would write in Japanese. Besides yourself, were there any other people working under him? Yes, uh, Mr. Teo Kat Seng, who was also an interpreter and at one time he was a registrar of uh, Singapore citizens. But he's retired now. He was one of those who were copying. So the main work there was just to copy down the notes that... Um, yeah, yeah, we are, we're Japanese. just Japanese copies. Mm -hmm. You stayed in this department until you were selected for the judicial officer's That's training. Right. Could you tell us, um, when you were working with under Lieutenant Mukai, whether there were any changes in terms of uh, working conditions or others? No. So same, we just attend office, office hours. He was very kind to us. He always appreciates us. And he, of course, speaks uh, Japanese English. Just very uh, comical. He would come and say, uh, half in Japanese, half in uh, English, and say, Kyo wa ne, gentleman, take care of your health, don't you? <laughs> gentleman, take care of your health. <laughs> if you don't hear some Japanese English. So you were all still considered as interpreters on loan to this department? Yes, right. We are interpreters on loan to the research department. And then when the scheme of judicial officers was uh, promulgated, there were 386, I still remember, throughout Singapore and Malaya, and Malaya who took the entrance exam. And they selected 12. And I was one of the lucky 12 to be selected. It was open to both um, interpreters in Malaya. Oh, it's open to all, to the whole nation. Who is widely broadcast. Anyone can take the exam. Including those from Malaya? Yeah, yeah. So quite, uh, out of uh, Malaya, five were selected. From Singapore, seven were selected. So there were 12. What kind of entrance examinations did all of you have to take? We took a Japanese test. Which was, I think, um, written the oral, and we had to write one essay on the Greater East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere. <laughs> that is a very Dai To A Kyo E King. Yes, that is it. Of course, in order to uh, get admitted, you must say how good this concept is and this will produce a land of milk and honey, you see. <laughs> I still remember I said that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to say those things that, that, they, uh, that, they, uh, that, that they think they are able to produce. Uh. So it was not an entrance examinations based on the legal studies? No, uh, how could, we are all greenhorns too. It's based on your English and your Japanese. Before you were selected for this training program, when you were working in the court and in the research department, did the Japanese um, try to promote their culture? For instance, did they, like the first time when you met, you were made to bow to the Japanese flag? So subsequently, were you made to do the same things? Just after one or two times, then they left you alone. The first time was just sort of uh, initiating you into the system. 
So after a few bowings, they also got fed up. So, you know, that's purely ritualistic, no meaning. And even if they lectured to us in Japanese, we would not understand very much. They had some interpreter here yeah, in the beginning here. Yeah. Uh, any occasions when they asked the local people to celebrate their, their Japanese festivals? Or? Well, one, one big one is the Tento Sets. Mm -hmm. April 29 is the Emperor's birthday. I still remember very well. So that is a big, big holiday. So. How did they ask you to, how did they go about celebrating it? Well, maybe they may have the gathering together with the bowing to the Japanese flag again. And Maybe we got a holiday for that. Did the local employees participate in the celebrations? We had. I mean, if they call us to, to assemble and give a lecture, you all had to line up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So besides this, uh, did they try any other means to promote their culture among, or their idea of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere among the local employees? No, and they left us alone. But I still remember there was the Indian Independence Army, you know. Subhas Chandra Bose was the one who was heading, and then you could see these skinny Indians, you know. And uh, they were learning to march on the field. That was a very comical sight. Uh, There's something, uh, they were trying to, you know, to get some support in it. In that way, but of course, uh, we, we, we simply say it's a sham. <laughs> the Indians are so skinny, they had, they had barely anything to eat, yeah, so they were so thin. Yeah, how could they fight? The Judicial Officers Training Institute was started by the courts. It's by the military government, and by, yeah, by, the, by the courts section, uh -huh. legal, legal, legal section, yes. Only for interpreters? No, it is open to all, not to interpreters. It's a competitive exam. So 386 all over Malaya and Singapore took this exam. And out of that, they chose. Of course, Mr. Lao Seng Boon and myself, we two of the courts were chosen because maybe of our excellence in Japanese. So the others may not be involved in the courts at all before they were Oh selected. yeah, there were others, not, not in the courts. Who, who got chosen. Eh? Did you know the purpose behind this uh, training institute? Oh, they said that they, they wanted to have uh, local magistrates to help to maintain law and order, they told us. And after the war, actually one of, the, one of our graduates was sent to Tanjong Pinang, Rio Islands. In those days, the Rio Islands came under Jap uh, Japanese Singapore administration. So um, immediately he graduated in uh, June. He was sent to Rio Islands to be magistrate there. So when all of you graduate from this institute, you will become magistrates. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So besides the legal studies and language, were there any other subjects that were taught? Japanese history. Yeah, that we had to learn. Any others? English law, Japanese law, Japanese history, Japanese. That's all. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a full-time training? Oh yeah, very, program. very intensive. Lectured, lectures from uh, morning to afternoon, and then we had to go home. We, I didn't stay in my house. We, we had a boarding house. We stayed together. Of course, I could bring my wife there. There is a room to myself. But I, we, we stayed in the boarding house so that we could study more intensively. So the first time, there were only 12 of you for the training, the pioneers? Only, they, they had only this class. Then they had surrendered already. In, in three months after we graduated, they already surrendered. So was it compulsory for all 12 of you to stay in the boarding house? Rather a privilege given to us. And we like it because uh, we get free food. Eh? <laughs> Everything was provided for. They gave us free food and a house to stay, dormitory, very privileged, I would say, in those days. Did you have to pay for the training? No, 
They paid us. We don't pay for our training. They pay for everything, our makan, our rooms, free tuition. Did they continue to give you your pay? Yeah, yeah. The pay was as usual. On top of that, you are selected, you get this privilege. The lecturers that were there, um, did they come only for lectures or were they full-time staff attached to the training institute? They just come for the lectures. By special arrangement, I guess. They might have, uh, each one got an honorarium for this. Were there any full-time full -time staff attached to the training institute? No. The, the, the institute was very easily run. The lecturers, the lecturers just came in according to the schedule, timetable. After lecturing, they go. Who was overall in charge of the training institute? Oh, that would be the Japanese, one of the Japanese judges, head of it. Would he be the one to plan the schedule, the time? Oh, yeah, yeah. He would be the one who arranged all, all these lecturers, the courses of study, what we should learn. Yeah. Was there a kind of office where they carry out these administrative details daily? No. Only 12 people. There, there isn't much of administration. And the Japanese are... The administration would be the court, the, the, the Supreme Court. One of the judges in charge. Sakamoto. Sakamoto... Judge Sakamoto was the head of the training. Besides the lectures, were there any other uh, kind of training that were provided? For instance, did they try to train you up physically? No. The judges themselves were men of uh, letters. We, de we seldom see them doing anything physical. They just sit in the chambers reading. <laughs> When you were at this training institute, did you have to participate in any cultural programs? No. They left it very free to us. So it was purely studying yeah, all yeah. the way? Yeah, purely uh, academic. Mm -hmm. We appreciate very much those uh, days of training because uh, we all learned the English system with, as I told you, one Japanese law uh, subject. and. All these who lectured to us were former magistrates and uh, lawyers, well known in society. Did did uh, all of you have to wear uniform of no, some kind? No, no uniform at all. So in the evenings, uh, would you be allowed to do whatever you like, free to do whatever you like? Oh, we were completely free. We will be studying away like mad. <laughs> it's a very intensive call. We are studying, rivaling each other, you know. Very, very hard study. Mm -hmm. um, the examinations for the course was only held at the end of the course? Yeah, at, each, at the end of six months, we had oh. one exam. At the end of another six months, another exam. Two final exams. Okay. What kind of uh, examinations? Oh, they were, I should say, rider type of questions that you have to to, to solve a problem, you know, legal legal problems. From what you study, you must be able to apply them. And they are very intelligent questions we have to answer. How did you find the standard of the training there? I think it was British standard. They are all Cambridge men, most of them. Cambridge and uh, London U. One was Ahmad Ibrahim, ah, I remember. Ahmad Ibrahim is now dean in University of Malaya, is he? Ahmad Ibrahim, you find it out. K.M. Burn, Ahmad Ibrahim, oh, Hashim, oh yeah, I know. Judge Hashim, he was a public prosecutor in, from Malaysia. Hashim, Braga, L.C. Go, Tantun Lip, K.A. Tan, we got seven or eight of them. So all S, yes. oh, nine of them. Mm -hmm. All two of you graduated in June, and yeah, yeah. five. 45, yeah. Were you awarded with any kind of certificate or...? Yeah, we were given a certificate which we lost. So. <laughs> Japanese certificate. Do you remember what kind it was? In Japanese, yeah. But uh, where it is now, I don't know. So after graduation, 
um, what did you do before the British came back to Singapore? Well, then uh, my father, living in Batapat, uh, desired very much that I should uh, go back. And I went to beg the officer to send me to Batapat as an assistant magistrate. And uh, then I went to, I was sent, so I went to Jawabaru to report for duty that now, to report for duty in Jawabaru that I'm being sent to Batapat as an assistant magistrate. But the days of the end of the Japanese Empire was near, so that was um, end of July or something. And um, or August, then we heard that the atom bomb fell. So my father said, you better stay put at home, don't show your face. So that's, that's the end. <laughs> I never showed my face in Fatima. You never reported? No. Or... They were themselves in a, in a hurry and in a scurry. The Japanese already, you can see that they were very uh, unsettled. So they, they did not come to you to bother no, you to No, nobody bothered. For... This was a time of survival of the fittest, free for all. Everybody had to take care of themselves. Yeah? At that time when you were working in the court and when you were studying in this training institute, did you know what were the people's general attitudes towards civil servants at that time? They were not against us at all. They knew everybody was in the same boat. We have to pull along. Nobody would say that we are traitors or what. Everybody was under the administration. It was, uh, the British did not count us to have been collaborators because uh, under the system it's quite plain we had to go back to work and besides when they went back to work unless you became a running dog of the Kempe Thai then you begin to extort all that you would be in a bad situation but we were ordinary functional cocks in the wheel of a government eh? <coughs> What was uh, your general impression of the Japanese administrators, the, the Japanese government, and the whole system that you're working in? Well, they inspired a fear in everybody by their very strict way of uh, giving commands. It's a military situation, and nobody dared to challenge them. But the fact was that, that in our judicial training, we were treated as uh, like on the gas, they respected us, that we are the cream of the crop. So they respected us a great deal. And we respect them, they are, I should say, quite gentle people, the judges and the legal officers. What about other groups of Japanese who were in Singapore at that time? Of course, there were those who are called the Kabushiki Kaisha, these uh, Kumiai, all these, you know, cooperatives and, and uh, law, I mean, uh, commercial groups and all that. And then those who want to make money go and collaborate with them. Did you have uh, opportunities to mix around and observe all these other groups? Or would you just... No, I was only concentrated in my studies. I didn't bother anything. How did you get to know of the British, uh, of the Japanese surrender? It's very plain though, because uh, there's no more firing, so we conclude the British have given up. And their planes are circling everywhere, showing off, eh? then there's no more firing, so we know the surrender had come. How about the Japanese surrender? The Japanese surrender, I was in Batapat then, and uh, there was a great jubilation in Singapore. I wasn't here, but uh, then we left Batapahat. My house was in I, I, locked, I locked it up and I came back. When did you come back to Singapore after the... I believe it was British? sometime in uh, September. September I came back. The British landed I think sometime in September too. After that we, we came back. Did you go to the city hall to witness the Japanese No, I, I came back after that. How was the situation in Singapore at that time, uh, in September when you came back? Oh, then the whole city was astir, very happy. So you can see the life is very brisk, everyone rushing here and there, you know. The first thing was they went to the provision stores to buy food and for the first, uh, after so many years, we had 
Australian onions and flour and these nice things of life, which you never ate for four years, <laughs> for three and a half years. The, these uh, uh, foods began to, uh, to arrive and they were selling like hot cakes. So those uh, food merchants were making a lot of money when imports began to arrive. Did you know what happened to the Japanese judges and other civilian administrators? I don't know what happened to them. What do you think was the impact of the whole occupation period on your life personally? Well, um, I think it disrupted many an ambition. Many were on their way, you know, to attainment, and it suddenly cut short their career. And uh, we saw how the Many mushroom millionaires during the Japanese days disappeared as fast as the Japanese left. And that's one phenomenon. They were thriving because of the Japanese collab collaborators. Once they left, they also had no more such business. What about yourself? What did you think the occupation um, the impact on your life? In so far as I was concerned, I was um, an ambitious young man. I did not want to let the days go by without some sort of attainment in knowledge and study. So I went into this uh, judicial office scheme purely for the sake of uh, advancement of my own education. At least that's uh, something to study during these days of prison-like life, you know. Otherwise, we are, they call it, we are locked up in a bird cage in Singapore. Shonan, they call it the Jiolang. Jiolang in Teo Teo is a bird cage. Eh? They, they, they just uh, pun the word. Eh? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are like birds in a cage. So as far as I'm, I'm concerned, I make good use of the time. Eh? Do you have any other things that you'd like to add to what you have already said so far regarding your experiences during that period? I should say I was very fortunate that I did not suffer any violence under the Japanese though there was once uh, I was riding a bicycle and it was at Havelock Road police station and the Japanese sentry was there. I didn't go and bow to him, you see? so he called me and he gave me a, a crack on my forehead. <laughs> and that was the only time I suffered under them. And of course I doubt, bowed to them and say sorry. But they are very stern and they won't talk. They just gave me a, a crack on the forehead. <laughs> Other than that, I was very fortunate. I should say God protected us in a marvelous way. Thank you very much, Reverend. All right. <laughs>